I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome back to Consult Week 6 for Jennifer Marie and John. The biggest question we got when we recorded this live was, what is that on her head? So I start by introducing you to my favorite hat made out of six pelts of skunk. Talk about a great carnivore diet. Just kidding. This week, we learned so much from Jennifer Marie and John as they have some struggles and successes with the ketogenic diet. Their plateau has been a rough go of it, and in the last couple of weeks, we've really addressed some of the more intimate issues with John. These issues have to do with his sleep, how to get his brain to really shut down, and how to get the alcohol away from bedtime. These are real life issues, and because John is my patient, I can help him and give him medical advice. Remember, this show is about educating you, and please take the time to encourage Jennifer Marie and John for sharing their struggles and sharing their successes. We all get to learn because of this journey. Please check out the show notes on this one. Jennifer Marie is an amazing cook, and I've included several of the links that she uses in this video in our show notes. Once again, thanks for tuning in. We're helping people with their health one ketone at a time. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Keto Talk with Dr. Boz and myself, Jennifer Marie. We do this every Sunday night, 7 p.m., 7, cent 7 central time. And I am so happy to talk to you, Dr. Boz. Uh, tell me about your hat, first of all. Ah, this is my skunk cat. Isn't it great? Uh, I love my it. My skunk cat is uh, telling you where I'm at right now because I am in Canada. Uh, so you know that I live in South Dakota. And um, my husband on the day before Christmas says, we are getting on a train ride. We're going to drive to Manitoba, uh, to, uh, to Winnipeg, Manitoba, get on a train ride for over two days, go to nearly the Arctic Circle. It's not quite, but it's so close compared to the rest of the world that it should be considered the Arctic Circle. The little town is called Churchill, Manitoba, and it's on the Hudson Bay. And one of the, I've, I've mentioned this before, my husband... Uh, loves checking things off my bucket list. Uh, my son has wanted to see the Northern Lights. I've wanted to see the Northern Lights. It's the polar bear capital of the world. And it was 50 below zero in 50? Canada. Five zero? Five zero. So everybody wears hats like this in Canada when you are in Churchill. But it was, uh, it was a beautiful train ride. The Northern Lights, I mean, the Northern Lights are, there's something about it being really cold. And so it's not usually this cold in December. Usually you'll get the best Northern Lights in like January or February. But oh, I have the most beautiful pictures of the Northern Lights. Um, thankfully, we did not see any polar bear. Uh, but we did. The kids got to go on a, um, a motion. Will is somebody who has dogs that take you on a sled ride. And so they got to go on a traditional motion dog sled ride and just has been a great little trip. Um, we headed home, we got on our train last night at around 11, and I thought I was going to do this broadcast from the train, but our, our little our little engine that could died in the middle oh of gosh. nearly nowhere, which was really scary last night, uh, but it gave me a great opportunity to get the pictures of the Northern Lights because the train stopped and then there was no lights. Oh but my gosh. You could die out there in the cold. That's uh, so scary. That is so oh, yes. scary. Oh my God, I would die. 50 below, I don't. Mm -mm. <laughs> and there's nobody around for like a good, like 50 miles before the next person. You're on this train in the middle of nowhere. But it, it was really good for our family and just a very good reset. And, you know, I've, I've also talked about just going to the Inuit. Um, the Inuits are the name of the natives that are in that region of Northern Canada. And I don't, have you ever heard of the word Inuit or the Inuit diet? No. So, Inuits uh, is, is a ketogenic diet. They're one of the first that has been studied. And it was actually by a painter who went up to Northern Canada, lived with these Inuits for over a year, doing the sketches of how they lived, and came back um, and shared that, you know, they live off of a 80, you know, 75 to 80% fat diet. They are sustained on that while well, he was there for a year. And for the first time in, um, you know, kind of recorded 
uh, can you can you live without carbohydrates? These the Inuits were kind of given credit for exampling. No, 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 they are very healthy. They are very strong. Their you know their skeletal structures are you know strong, thick bones. Their teeth were healthy, and they lived long lives. And wow. it was so. It's been a very good. You know, I, you've been in the ketogenic world long enough that you hear these naysayers that say you can't do it. It's not sustainable. You've got to have fruit. I mean, if you ever want to see a, a hate column, go to the video that I, <laughs> that's titled that I did that says fruit is evil. And oh, my goodness, the number of people that did not even listen to it just went, eh, we're going to hate on this um, yeah. because they think, oh, this ketogenic diet isn't sustainable. And, you know, I would contend it is a very sustainable diet. It's just that in today's world, you find the temptations that, I don't know about you, but over the last week, I have had every temptation that I have fallen victim to. to oh, wow. Good thing New Year's resolutions are like tomorrow. <laughs> well, the, the other thing is when you've been doing the ketogenic diet for a while, you can bounce back pretty quickly. Yes. And I think that's the best part is that, you know, I am adapted. And so, you know, my kids are pretty strong on me saying, mom, are you fasting? Mom, that's not ketogenic. And you just want to say, hey, I can be human too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. even I, you know, as much of a proponent as I am of it, yeah, you fall off and you make yeah. a decision that isn't perfect, but then it won't take long and I'll be back in the, in the graces of it. Exactly. And, Hey, we have a, I know we don't normally do questions right on, but um, I'm seeing a lot of comments. Um, and I have one question that I think you want to, you should answer right away. Um, here's, I'm going to show this comment because I think that you should um, answer this one pretty quick, if you don't mind. Cynthia yeah, Armstrong great. says she bought your ketones in a can, which by the way, okay. can you see those? Ah, right mm -hmm. there. Ketones in a can. Um, she bought your ketones in a can. What are the macros, carb, fat, calories, et cetera? There's no info on the can. So oh, that's great. So th these are um, salts. So the most important part on, a, on an exogenous ketone is what did they mix? So if you'll see on that, there is magnesium, sodium, and calcium that's mixed with the beta hydroxybutyrate in the Dr. Ba's example. And then the, uh, there's a sugar substitute, which uh, per dose, it is less than one carb per, it's like a 0.4 carb. And so through the manufacturing and you look at space and size and all the things you got to make decisions for on a label, that it's under the reportable amount. So um, it's a sugar substitute. I, I'll, I think if you've watched me long enough, you'll know sugar substitutes uh, I don't have a huge affection for, but if there's one place that I use them, it's in conjunction with the day of these um, exogenous ketones. So there's no fat, there's uh, no carbs, there's no protein in there. Uh, what you have in there are salts. That's what ke uh, exogenous ketones are. These are salts. Um, it's really important, important when you have exogenous ketones. I like to call them ketones in a can so that you don't mix them up with MCT. These are ketones made in a lab. They're off patent. Um, there are some great benefits for what I use them for patients, but you should have magnesium whenever you're doing a supplement for a ketogenic diet. There, it is just the universal problem that I find with um, folks who are on a ketogenic diet is that they've been low on magnesium, but they didn't know it, uh, or they just hang out on the edge where they don't have symptoms. So if you're on a ketogenic diet, you will kind of flush out uh, even more magnesium. And so I think it should be in every supplement that's associated with a ketogenic diet. So that's why it's in there. So we have, I mean, we're getting a lot of questions. Should we do a quick recap of last week and then get, get into questions? Because I think we have a lot more questions than what we normally do. That's great. We can do that. No, that's awesome. It makes it easier, uh, you know, for yeah. me, actually. Okay. So you want to give an update of let's just start with you're back home. You're not traveling. How are you doing? So I'm back home. John is not with us today because he's traveling. So um, let me just give you an update real quick on him. He is doing amazing since the three-day sleep protocol. His pain has completely, not completely gone, but it's really lessened, which is a big deal for him. Um, he's sleeping really good, except for he goes to bed 
early and then wakes up really early. So his, his, um, circadian <laughs> rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little off because he goes to bed so early. Um, I tease him and tell him, Oh, you're an old man, but yeah, he's getting good sleep. What does it matter? You know, whatever. So, no. you know, he's, here's a great analogy for that too. As I look at that brain, I mean, again, my first first part of my career was in an ICU. This is where I, I was going to be an ICU doctor until I had kids and said, uh, but it's amazing when you have brain injury patients in an ICU, um, the only way they get better is the depth of their sleep is how well you can get them to sleep. So when you look at John's history and know that he was in those accidents, he got the medical care he needed, but then he ended up with this chronic pain syndrome that just perpetuated the only way you get out of that is the is the required deep sleep that you need to repair so yeah. as much as it's a hiccup in the plan that he goes to bed earlier i would say gradually this will go back to a normal level but let him own this or kind of hone that skill of shutting the brain down and waking up and then staying awake without that pain it gets so much better in the first few weeks um, of no, how often has he used the medicine in the last week? None. Zero. So just, you can give him a, a message and this is just to kind of show people how this, once they have kind of awakened the, the little messages that shut the brain down, um, you know, using that medication once or twice a week when he has the privilege to, to, um, not have performance that next morning is a great way to just remind that that nerve, which one should be working. Um, and then especially to use the medication if he falls uh, out of the habit, like, you know, stress hits him or some, you know, he gets an injury um, and he just can't shut that brain down. Um, think of these nerves as their, their baby nerves. They're just figuring it out again. So if they fall off the pattern, boy, it's, we end up back where we started from. It's fixable, it's trainable, but a couple of nights of not sleeping well, just find a way to get the medicine in just the one pill, not the two, but it's a great little trick. The longer he stays in the pattern, the less he'll need the medication, but use that as a, as a crutch to get him uh, to stay in that groove of deep sleep. Okay. So I do want to talk to the audience just a bit. I've had many people reach out to me about the protocol, the sleep three day protocol. I am going to promise you, Dr. Boz and I are going to work on something where we can get this information out to you. Um, she's going to put something on her blog. I'm going to put something on my blog. We will get you some sort of resource, re, um, some sort of reference that you can give to your own doctor and possibly talk about this being an option. See if it's an option for you. Mm -hmm. um, we promise to do that. It's not going to be real soon, um, not with the holidays and traveling and all that. Uh, but we are working on it. Just know it's on our goal list. Yes. Um, so I will definitely give him that update. Let's see. Um, okay. My update. <laughs> I, I tell you, um, I was sick two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I was still sick last week. Um, I'm still have a little bit of stuff mm -hmm. coming up, not taking any medicine, not taking anything. I, ever since I took the Augmentin that was prescribed for um, my sinuses, I have, I cannot get my ketones up. Like mm. I was in the 1.4, I was in the 1.7, and I was starting to be in 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I think the most was 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. Oh, so, you know, that, that, uh, that can be discouraging you know when you don't check numbers you just know that you're not losing weight when you do check numbers you're like well bugger this is not going to lead to weight loss so it's kind of like you know ahead of time that there's trouble ahead uh, let's just make sure i capture the full picture how uh, what has your weight done well i lost 0 0.90 pounds okay in one week yes with being sick. Yeah. That's impressive. No, very good job. Seriously, that I was expecting a zero or even a weight gain. Oh, so. oh, really? Well, remember, I'm one that stays pretty strict. And I did. I stayed pretty strict even through not feeling well. Um, bone broth. I always tell people 
if you're going to have everything, you know, people always ask me, Jennifer, what do you take when you're sick? Or what do you, what crackers do you have? Or do you do Sprite for an upset tummy or crackers? And I'm like, I don't do any of that. I do bone broth. Yep. Mm, it's really good. No, it's, it's like, oh, can I have more patients like Jennifer? <laughs> uh, because it, it's, it's discouraging and they get that setback and then to get them motivated to try again and say, no, 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 it's a chemistry set. We're just working with chemistry. And when, yeah. when you have little invaders come in, this is the price. Your body fights it and uh, hang so, in there. So I'm doing everything. Mm -hmm. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. I'm eating exactly the way I was before I got sick. Why don't you remind um, the audience what that is? Because I think that's great for them to hear. What's the goal and how well you are doing? So what time do you eat and what time do you Oh, okay. Stop? So I usually, my eating window, I do intermittent fasting. My eating window is between five in the morning and five at night. I fast yeah. 12 hours a day. If for some reason I go over the five, it's never really past six. It's okay. really important for me to correct my insulin resistance, not to eat late in the evening. If I do eat one hour over, I will move the time up, like stop eating at four or earlier the next day if I've done something wrong. So that Very gives good. my body enough time to really release the insulin out of my liver. And my sugars are great. My sugars are between 72 and 79. Oh, so awesome. mm. I am doing good there. I am experiencing something these last two weeks that is almost embarrassing. Um, I am sweating. I go through these sweating episodes um, three times in the middle of the night. It makes me crazy. Um, this happened to me in the very beginning when I started keto um, because of my age. I'm only 47, only. <laughs> no. um, I, my doctor thought I was going through menopause already, but going to the gynecologist, she said, no, there's absolutely no way. After doing um, a scan and looking at um, the ovaries and how plump they are, she's mm -hmm. like, I could tell you if you're even close and you're not even close. So Yay. it's kind no. of making me a little crazy that... This is like new, I feel like this is me starting keto all over again, because I remember this in the beginning and it is, I don't even know how to stop it. I, I was thinking it was a vitamin deficiency because I ran out of my vitamin D3, which I'm chronically low on. Mm -hmm. I went out and got some, I started taking big doses to catch up. It's not helping. What is going on? Well, so it's, it's great actually to hear that you're having some of this. It, it is, think of the, <laughs> I know, I'm like, I'm not a masochist. I don't like for you to have torture, uh, but it's a metabolism that's saying, you no, know, we're revving up to a, to a higher level of production. Mm. Um, and when people first go keto, uh, they, you know, you look at what happens with chronically overweight patients and their whole temperature profile is, um, slower. Their, their metabolism is slower. And one of the, one of the consequences of kind of shifting gears for metabolism is that you produce energy. And if you have a mismatch about how much energy your body's producing versus the need, so you can perspire. Uh, some of the other things that I've found are powerful comes to increasing metabolism is that when they've shifted like that, um, so this is, take you to some nightmares for a second. If a patient comes in and they're 70 years old and they say, doc, I got these night sweats. I I'm sweating in the night. I mean, there is a list of really bad things that, that comes to a mind, the mind of a doctor. Um, and they are all like, e we're going to have a tough chapter together. And, but what sparks that fever in the middle of the night uh, is their metabolism shifted. And it's something on the metabolism that said, hey, I am at a higher production level than I used to be. So some of those things, this is not for you, but when the when the 70 year old comes in, says, doc, I got night sweats at night, something's wrong. You know, I instantly think of, does he have a cancer? Um, does he have a fungal infection that is like tuberculosis is, is known for doing that? Um, all of these things are very subtle parts of their metabolism but have dramatically the in and out for how much energy is required in their system. So having said that, um, it, it isn't a consequence that you got an illness, which again is a demand from your body 
saying, hey, I got to fight this off. My white blood cells have got to step it up and take care of these little critters that invaded my lungs. My little the antibiotics you get are only like a 20% improvement for healing infections. People say, oh, I got antibiotics. I'm going to be better. I'm like, uh, uh, it's all up to your white blood cells. Those antibiotics are just a tweak to get you over the edge. Uh, so the metabolism shift for night sweats says, I mean, the, the shift in your body for, that you're having sweats in the night, sure, it could be menopause, but it's more likely that you've had a shift in your metabolism over the last two months where you have more mitochondria working on your team, which is a higher level of metabolism. That's why you're losing weight. And then you added an infection. And so now there's a mismatch between demand and production. So as hard as it is to tell somebody to stay the course, I would tell you to stay the course. Um, other things, though, that I've known, uh, there's some, um, you know, the literature on this is, well, I won't get into that. Some things that we've talked about before, any type of replacement of magnesium is going to be helpful. So if you can do a couple of or a float this week, uh, oh, well. it would be good for you. Um, that really does kind of keep the... Um, just reset, uh, like think of it as draining out the salts and putting in the magnesium. Um, I hate to overprescribe that, but it is something I've just been shocked at how many times two of those does more than I could do in three weeks of playing with uh, prescription medication. So I have, I have a salt spa actually scheduled, I think for tomorrow or the next day, I'll have to check my schedule. But should I be worried about my ketone number? Is there any way? In fact, that's another question from somebody else is how to increase the ketone number. Like, how do you do that naturally? Right. So again, this comes from your, uh, you know, your liver is where your body produces ketones. Uh, it produces ketones by accessing fat, uh, whether the fat comes through your mouth or comes through your storage tank in your body, it comes from your stored fat. Uh, doesn't matter much to your liver, it will still take that fat and turn it into ketones. Uh, you can do some tricks to kind of boost the body. Uh, this wouldn't be in your case, but other people watching, that's where we do the BHB salts. That's where we do a CT. Uh, and that just helps the body get used to that higher level of ketones. And it is a good energy. They feel better. So especially my newbies. But we take somebody in your case, you've been around the ketogenic diet for a while, you've made some shifts that definitely have changed your metabolism. And now we want to say, well, the ketone number is, um, I mean, we're, we're tracking it to try and help you keep losing weight. Um, so you haven't hit over a 1.0 yet, right? In the last week. But you did say that your morning fasting sugars were under... 80, right? Yeah, they've been 72, 74, 72, 78, and 79, and 75. Wow, great numbers, Jennifer. That's just, that's wonderful. I would contend that that, that does equate to still losing weight. So again, if mm -hmm. our goal is losing weight, I would say this is going to reset itself. Um, the other part, though, is you've seen me not say one time about doing any activity. If you wouldn't have been sick the last two weeks, I would have put on your schedule or in your life uh, a place where you go for a walk or find something that you can do for um, uh, the first. Because have you had an exercise schedule before? Um, honestly, with my job, it keeps me at my desk. So mm -hmm. mm -mm, no. not a whole lot. I try to go for walks and I have a treadmill. Um, I was doing... Um, a mile two on the treadmill, but I haven't in a while. So no. Well, and, and I'll tell you when I'm first uh, consulting for people on a ketogenic diet, we do not talk exercise. They have to master the chemistry or they can, you cannot walk your way out of a bad diet. You can not walk your way out of a bad chemistry set. What you can do is when, once you've got your chemistry mastered, and I would say we're there for you. Those are really good sugars, even in this setting of illness. If we did nothing, I would probably see your ketone numbers creep back up to about a one. We'd like them to see them about a one. Uh, but uh, that alone still says you've got a ratio that's gonna, gonna uh, equate to weight loss. Um, mm -hmm. The, the one little exercise that I'm a big fan of because I think it's easy, cheap, safe. And as much as I'm in Canada with this silly hat on, um, in South Dakota, <laughs> you cannot believe the list that I get from patients saying, you know, doc, 
I exercised because it was too windy. It rained. It snowed. It the wind was blowing. The sun was shining. It was cloudy. I mean, you find some weather component, and that's why they didn't exercise, right? So I'm a big fan of handing out jump ropes, and the goal is one minute of jump rope, mm-hmm. and you record how many times you got over the jump rope in one minute, and you do one minute one minute a day. That's all you're doing. So again, what you're doing is it's a high intensity exercise that's very rate limited and it is not dependent on the weather. This is kind of one of those things like any habit, uh, there's got to be a tiny little routine that you start and it gets stronger the longer you do it. So if I was looking for what would I encourage somebody who, you know, your profile is, is very, very common, busy life, lots going on doesn't have a strong history of these, you know, I go to the gym three hours a week, well, you know, nope. Uh, Start with a jump rope and make it one minute commitments. Um, I I would have you consider that before you commit to it. Um, Just knowing that the commitment is, it's only one minute, but it is, um, it's a challenge to do it every day. Yeah. Well, one minute, I mean, we could all do something for one minute, right? That doesn't seem very hard. So that would be a neat little challenge. And um, honestly, when I start feeling better, because I haven't had any energy, like I'm not the type of person to lay around and I've been laying around. So that's my body telling me I need rest. Right. But it yeah. sounds like I could even do that. It sounds like maybe we should we should put that challenge in the group, the one minute jump rope video. I would actually probably like that. I might die the first minute, but <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how long a minute is when I, ah. I mean, when people come into my clinic and I'm training for brain stuff, like whether it's addiction or sleep or just a ketone brain, I will have them. I go to jails. I do this and they'll uh, do the jump rope for a minute and I can pick out the people that have used meth, um, meaning their brains are just not working right. And you yeah. watch what a jump rope routine can do to their brains. And it's incredibly yeah. reparative. But it also is this great little metabolism that it boosts. And it's very time limited. It's intense enough to be cardiovascular. Um, so I, I love jump rope. It's a great little trick. Perfect. I'm very competitive. So I like posting like, okay, here's my one minute number. What's your one minute number? Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> I like that. We might have to do something like that. Um, you know what? We have, gosh, we have so many questions. I wonder how quickly we can get through this because I really, I want this talk to be so valuable for everybody who's joined us here. Um, let's see here. Um, the first one, Dr. Boz would love to know more about iron deficiency. Do you have more information available? What would you say to somebody who's iron deficient? Okay, so bozmd.com. If you go to, um, that's my, my blog, my website, there is a, a section on there called Interviews with Dr. Boz. And the first two that are on there are with the keto woman. And it talks about iron deficiency and what I did with some patients there. Um, I've probably never really talked about that, the, the iron deficiency as much as I did in, that, in those two interviews. It's a two-hour interview. There's a lot more to the story about my life, but the, the iron deficiency is one of the key things that um, really drove me to put up a, a line in the sand saying, this has to be fixed or their brains cannot repair. You know, Jennifer, you and I have talked about this where when people have had a gastric um, surgery, Uh, There is a a short section in the gut that absorbs iron. And so many of these gastric surgeries around where that section comes from, or they inhibit it. And then unfortunately, in a high carbohydrate diet, in a standard American diet, they don't eat a lot of iron. So the cells that are there to absorb the iron get they go into hibernation. They don't work very well. Mm -hmm. And boy, I find that, um, the, (laughs) I think, wasn't it you that I said, we're going to have, uh, you go on a 30 days of Braunschweiger only. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And that's, that's one of the reasons why is because if those cells are low and you don't give them any good nourishment to pull that iron out of the, out of the uh, body and brain, I mean, out of the, out of the, the food and put it into your body and brain, you're going to suffer quite some time. You know, I did a really good white paper on this a while ago saying, what are all the benefits associated with um, replacing someone's iron? Um, And 
is, I should post that too. It's a really good paper saying you cannot believe the mental health, the cognitive yeah. health. Um, um, you know, somebody interviewed me once and said, um, if you, I have sons, but if I had daughters, uh, I would not let them have a period. I would get them to menstruation at about 14, 15 years old, and I would put an IUD in so they lost no blood. Because our girls that are growing, their brains are so deprived of iron because they have a period every month. And you say, what? That sounds crazy. That's so unnatural. I'm like, it's unnatural for, for us to, have, to not have babies at 15 years old. And if you look at the number of menstruation, of menstrual cycles a woman today has, and you compare it to a woman in uh, you know, 1850, uh, we have as many periods from the age of 14 to 21 as she had in her whole lifetime. Wow, really? Yes. Wow, that's it's crazy. Preg you know, pregnant at 16, you know, 17, 18, somewhere in there. And then it's pregnant and nursing and pregnant and nursing and pregnant and nursing. And so the, the cumulative number of menstruations you have in a lifetime is so much more today uh, that what happens is their brains are drained of iron and yet they're still asked to, they don't, their performance at math and sports is yeah. highly correlated to whether or not their iron is what is there. And so then they oh, go, I know. yeah, they go into the doctor and the doctor says, Hey, take an iron pill. I'm like, wait, in six years, your iron will be better. And yeah. that's if you're perfect on yeah. the iron supplement. Yeah. I had to actually do iron infusions um, every four to six months until I got my iron up to the levels they needed to be. But it was it was extremely important even for energy um, to have your iron. But um, I have a I've got another question. We should move on. Uh, okay. Let me introduce you to Kathleen Dexter. She's like one of my favorite persons. She's super active within the low carb inspirations group. She's always sharing good information. Um, she's just super helpful. She says, I have a question for Dr. Boz with regard to the carnivore lifestyle meaning mm. protein, salt, water only. Has mm -hmm. she tried it? And if so, what were the observations regarding mental clarity and weight loss, et cetera? This is kind of funny because, um, you know, I, I invented the beef and butter fast diet and that is total carnivore. So yeah. um, let's talk about that a little bit. And I'm, I'm also inviting you to the beef and butter fast group so we can talk about the science behind it. But let's, let's give uh, Kathleen a little bit of... Uh, your take on the carnivore diet. So again, I'm in Canada, uh, heading up to, to interview the, the Inuit population here in Churchill, Manitoba, uh, in part because they lived on a carnivore diet. Uh, that was their whole, uh, that was how they sustained life. Um, when you first go ketogenic, you know, getting patients to lower their carbs to less than 20 is, you know, some kind of like apocalyptic change for most Americans. To go further and say no carbs, fat and meat only, and stay there, um, you can't go there right out of the gate. There's so many changes and there's just so much cognitive dissonance. They're like, that's crazy, that's crazy. But boy, the longer you're in the ketogenic diet, the more you will naturally gravitate towards these very satisfying uh, foods, which are highly fatty meat, uh, and how, how well that does sustain you. The danger is when you are on, when you're an Inuit, when you're a native uh, person living, you know, in Northern Canada, they would eat the carcass from the nose to the tail. So they would eat the organ, meat, they would eat the bone marrow, they would eat the, you know, the tendons and skin were all part of uh, their, their diet. Um, one of the ways that they would preserve the meats was to pour the fat over the dried meat. And that would like seal the, the hot fat would seal the meat. But it also was kind of a raw meat. And so the nutrients was very well preserved. So when people ask me about the carnivore diet, there are some caveats. Um, you know, you should be eating organ meat if you're going to do the carnivore diet. Um, th that is where the, the high uh, nutrients of iron comes from. To go back to the last question, it is how, if you want to say, how do I sustain life uh, on a ketogenic diet and repair this iron deficiency or do carnivore? Boy, the organ meat becomes a must do if you're going to do that. Um, the other parts of this are um, that you, 
you know, the seed oils, I, I, I hope that people on a ketogenic diet don't use the corn oils and the sunflower oils that you're actually using, the beef tallow um, and the lard. Uh, those coming from the animal fats, they have some of the essential um, uh, nutrients in them. And then to make sure that there is sardines on your list. If you're going to be a carnivore only diet, boy, I can't tell you how many things you cover. If you put liver and sardines on your list, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, that's yeah, we've, we've started um, getting liverwurst from the uh, deli. Oh, and you like it? You know, uh, it's an acquired taste, but it's not bad. And I do, I mean, it's expensive, so I'm not going to let it go to waste. I am eating it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you know, it's satisfying. It doesn't take much and it's, I'm very busy. So to have something like liverwurst in the fridge that I can just pick out and eat and not cook. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hey, that's a great lunch. Right. You know, the things I I've liked with my liverwurst is have you ever done the mufalada? Mm -mm. It's like that oil salad. Oh, they have it at like Costco is where I first found it. But then I've, it's, it's this salty olive based salad. And I Ooh. mix that with the, the um, um, with Braunschweiger, put it in the fridge and the kids will snack on it as well. It's, it's very, the combination is like salty, but it's got kind of a texture now instead of just the paste. Um, so those together, they go in the fridge and they're gone in three days. So, well, that's nice that they're eating it. <laughs> yeah. So the answer um, to that question is carnivore. I do support. Um, it's one of those conversations where if I show that to a newbie keto person, they kind of lose their cool thinking, <laughs> what are you talking about? But honestly, yeah. that's what my family is mostly carnivore as we've definitely gravitated towards that over the last three years. Nice. Well, let me, let me talk to the audience real quick, because I know that we have some new people on here. Um, we have some people who are just now starting keto, of course, new year, new us, like we're, we've got our goals. And I love, love, love that I'm seeing so many new people, especially starting the keto diet, because it is the only diet and I don't even like to call it a diet. It's a way of life for me, but it is the only way of life that has actually um, worked for me in my goals and in lowering insulin resistance, which is my main goal. But the side benefit is weight loss. And I have a feeling that there's more people on here for the benefit of weight loss, not even realizing um, all the other brain benefits and uh, just so many benefits, health benefits for keto. But I do want to let you know, um, I myself am going to be doing <clears throat> five live training videos on how to start keto because I love to cook keto food and I want to share like mistakes and whatever with you. And I'm going to do that five days in a row starting on the first. So if you want to be part of that, write this down. It's called ketokickstart.net. Go there, put your name in, um, and I will tell. I will email you the times and when we get started with those live trainings because it's all for free. I just want to share the information to help you get started. I remember how hard it was to get started. I remember how frustrating, confusing. I want you to feel healthy. I want you to feel great. I want you to feel this amazing feeling that I feel on keto, and I just want to share that information. So. Uh, Let's get to another question. Are you uh, ready for another one, Dr. Boz? You bet. So there is somebody who wants to know how can they not lose weight on the keto diet? Yeah, right. So there is, uh, as much as we talk about um, the difference between addressing your chemistry at the beginning of a ketogenic diet, um, the that that focus is all on patients hearing that insulin is what insulates your body. Insulin is what stores uh, energy, which is how you acquire fat. Uh, when it comes to producing insulin, uh, carbs are what do that. If you're on a ketogenic diet where you're living in a state of ketosis, um, the, the first thing I would worry about is uh, if, if you're asking, should I be losing weight? I would, I would actually make sure that you've calculated, are you really at your lean weight? You know, I'll take the example of my dad, uh, 75 years old, and he started, he didn't, he'll never tell you he started keto. He's now keto, but there's no moment in time where he says, oh, I'm keto. He just kind of lived with my mom long enough and has acquired <laughs> what living with a ketogenic woman looks like. 
but he started out at 220 pounds and um, he's 75. He had high blood pressure. He had one of those farmer tummies, um, but he would not have said he was overweight. And I don't think anyone in his community would have said he's overweight. He got down to 190 and said, oh boy, I'm good. I mean, he is now at 160, which is actually the calculated weight that I said, dad, your kidney function will sustain 162 pounds. If you get below that, you don't have to talk to me about dialysis. And the only way that your body can do that without losing a bunch of muscle mass is a ketogenic diet. That means we get rid of all the extra fat stored in your liver, stored around your pancreas, stored around your kidneys, stored on, in your fingers, stored everywhere. So the first thing that I worry about when people say, boy, I don't want to lose any weight, doc, I would tell you to go to the internet and look at a BMI chart saying for your height and your weight, your body mass index, that's BMI, should be 24 or 25. And so if you look at your height and say, well, that's the ideal body weight that I really should be at. I know there's lots of naysayers out there about BMI, but just try not to have that argument right now. <laughs> Most people, if you go to 24 or 25, that's the weight you should be at. So the first conversation I have is just because the society says, oh, you're too skinny. What, what I really look at is what is your, your muscle power based on how much fat and muscle you have? If you truly are underweight, um, there are other things that weight has to do with. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in women, especially like my mom has really seen an improvement in her bone density. She's been keto for two and a half years with all kinds of other sorts of problems, but the, her weight has gone up in measurement of her bone density. Her body mass, her weight overall has gone down by about 40 pounds, maybe even 50 pounds actually. Um, so when people ask me about how do you not gain weight, there's an equation. It has everything to do with how many, how much fat are you pulling in and how much energy are you using in a day? Okay. So you'll see blogs out there saying, doc, I eat 7,000 calories a day. I'm ketogenic and I don't put on any weight. And if you look, they have all the energy in the world. They're fueled by ketones, um, but they are exercising a lot. They're doing outdoor work. They're swimming, uh, you know, with that temperature change in, in metabolism is, is higher. Uh, calories in, calories out is something that gets really touchy in the, in the ketogenic community. But once you've gone keto, you can keep your body mass up by, by eating. I mean, the, the calories yeah. go in Got and it. then you don't exercise. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we have, um, another question. It says, can keto help get rid of essential tremors? So essential tremors are, it's a loop in the brain that, um, the it's an, it's usually a associated with age, not always, but frequently associated with age. And that essential tremor, um, there's a loop. Uh, messages in the brain should go to a place and come back. You should send a message and the brain would fire back. When there's a loop, things like tremors happen. And so their brain, their, their body will sit there and they'll, um, you know, one of those tremors is Parkinson's. That's a resting tremor. Essential tremors um, are more associated with aging. So what we look at is how healthy is the brain that got the essential tremor? And when studying those patients, they have a chronic history usually of less than ideal sleep. Now that means for the last 30 years, we would have wanted you to get closer to eight hours of sleep. We would want you to get sleep like we talked about John getting. That's how your brain repairs. That's how you're, you put really nice dense fat around the nerves that, um, that do uh, control that tremor. Uh, but the other part of that is we don't want any inflammation in the brain. We want that brain free of extra, I'm going to say water, but it's really inflammation. And boy, the ketogenic diet is known for that being the best that it can be. Um, you go to the seizure patients and look at their autopsies, you know, 50 years of a ketogenic diet in a seizure patient. And you look at that brain under autopsy and you say, how did they get such beautiful brains when they were seizure patients? Are you sure this is the patient that had the seizures? Because their brain looks so beautiful. And, and you know that's a testimony to say what happens when you live a life that has low inflammation in the brain. So if that essential tremor has been going on for 20 years, you've been practicing the loop for 20 years, and now you say, Doc, I've been keto for three weeks and my tremor is still there. 
I'm here to say that's it's a slow process when it comes to nerve repair. Think of it as one millimeter per month. So if you've got 10 millimeters that you kind of are broken in the way that brain is functioning, that's 10 months of keto before we can see that that really has improved that signal where that tremor takes place. That's kind of a hedge of an answer because there are so many variables associated with that essential tremor. But I, I give hope to the people who've had brain injuries because um, I, I'm I'm here on this this podcast, this uh, video, um, and other formats because of how much help it's given my patients with brain injuries. Got it. So um, let's take a break from the questions real quick, and mm -hmm. I want to know from the audience what their goal is um, for the new year. Like, for instance, like Boz, you were talking earlier on your um, broadcast on YouTube to have a goal. Um, and, and what that is. And I think my goal, my goal first and foremost is probably to kick this insulin resistance and just be as healthy as I possibly can. And that is not only for me, but for my family as well. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, the side of that is losing weight. So that's good. But so what's, you, what's your goal? I think that's a great goal, though, to, to point out, though, I have patients that come in and they have fluffy goals. Like I want, you know, I want my insulin resistance to be better, but they don't have a way that they've measured it. And then we're going to measure it again. So when you look at goals that really have a focus and the I think the kind of the the grit to stay with your goal is that you can measure it. So as hard as it is for me to put a number on the line too, I've said that for my goal, which is, you know, I've, I'm not really focused on my weight. It hasn't been something that I've really pulled my energy into, um, but I would like to reach my ideal body weight, which is 125 pounds. I'm closer to 135. So that's a good 10. Some days it's 140 pounds, uh, depending, <laughs> might be that by the time I get back on the scale after this trip. Uh, but it's been something where I've just kind of been in this zone and not really reached the level that I've, uh, you know, that I've wanted to. So putting out there that this is your goal, I want to do it by June 1st. Um, so that's six months of 10, 10 pounds, 10 to 15 pounds. And, and I think, you know, putting that out there as a very specific goal, I haven't had a weight goal probably in 15 years. So it's a, it's an interesting thing for 2019 for me to put a weight goal in the, in the ether, in a solid form. But I would encourage you to do that too, saying, okay, insulin resistance is really good. If that's your goal, then we're, we should be checking the numbers to prove that your insulin resistance is better. Um, one way to measure that is to set sh weekly goals, uh, like you're going to hit your ratio of 40 or less once a week for the next 12 weeks. Um, and I think that is another way to, to kind of reinforce the bigger goal with these tiny caps of goals. That's, that's my goal for the year is to hit to hit one five by June first. Nice. Out loud. <laughs> you did. Now we have to hold you accountable. I know. I know. I, know. I, I think goals are really important, though, and I would love if you guys watching tell us what your goals are. We wanna we wanna hear um, where your mind is and what you're doing as well. Um, you know, two years ago, I I remember. New Year's two years ago, where I said another year, I want to lose weight, I want to lose weight. But there was something um, different that year where I really, really, really wanted it. Like I made the decision not just for two weeks to do it, but I actually put a ton of effort into it. And looking back at it, you know, uh, I didn't start it right away because keto was a lot to research. So I didn't start it until February. I had to be absolutely sure. I had to have all the knowledge behind me. It's, I felt like it was a huge learning curve. Um, and I've made every mistake in the book. So if there's anything to learn from, learn from all of my mistakes. I could save you tons of time. Um, but I did make the decision in February to do the diet. And I was very well informed. Um, I think that was key. But the other mm -hmm. key part was having a community to support me because there were times where I felt like flat on my face. And if I didn't have, uh, especially the people in the low carb inspirations group, if I didn't have those people to kind of support me and pick me up when I just fell on my face, I don't think I would be where I am today. So maybe that's why I have such a big heart for the group because um, I really don't think I would have gotten there without uh, the support from other people. and. Um, 
I don't know. Isn't that, a, isn't that just, it's, you know, it's a big deal. One of my uh, lists of, you know, ways that you stay uh, on a ketogenic diet from a tribe, you know, that, that accountability partner, maybe it's somebody at work. You don't have to be great friends. You're just accountability partners. You show up on Wednesdays, you sit together, you have lunch together, or you fast together, but you check in every week and say, this is how, this is how I'm doing. How are you doing? You know, the first uh, form of that I ever had was, it was actually a Bible study. And we just did it as a way, there was, the group kind of came together because we were all going through some stress. And, and um, it was amazing to me that there was, it was such a little thing. Like, this isn't like, you know, <laughs> how do we do heart surgery? <laughs> this was, you get together and as women, you just, you share with somebody how you're doing. Uh, and I've really found that format uh, as this support group is, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's human relation of checking in and then authentically saying, yeah, yeah, I screwed it up this week, but I'm going to try again. Or I, I find that so powerful that when you have a community that is like-minded and, you know, thank God for technology today that you can do this um, asynchronously through groups like uh, Low Carb Inspiration and many others. Yeah. So there's a comment from Susie. It says, I have read the Dr. Boz book. Let me just, uh, for those that are new in here, um, the book that she's referring to that most everybody has already read is called Any Way You Can by Dr. Annette Bosworth. And I highly suggest that you grab a copy. Um, it is an excellent read. It talks about Grandma Rose. It talks about uh, the ketogenic diet. It talks about Grandma Rose's battle with cancer and how she fasted for 40 days um, to really help her through that. And I highly suggest you read it. So that's the book that Susie Elliott is um, referring to. Um, the next thing it says, I'm in a stall right now and I'm about to try beef and butter fast. Susie, well, you are going to be surprised because <laughs> everybody who tries the beef and butter fast uh, is pretty successful. So that's a whole separate group. If you want information, just leave a comment below and we'll get you invited to that group because it's going to start um, pretty soon. Um, Dr. Boz, do you have anything to say about uh, your book or can you tell us how Grandma Rose is doing too? Right. So she had a, a week and a half ago or now it's two weeks ago now, um, a real threat of eyesight because the cancer has had built up in her eyes. And so she went on, we actually, my sister and I all did this together. This was before Canada, uh, where we all posted our numbers and, uh, really fasted, uh, several days to get her numbers down. And amazingly, she did so well. Uh, the inflammation decreased. She did not need any shots to the eye. Her vision has really not went back to 100%, but significant improvement, um, which we thought she was going to lose her eyesight uh, at the time that that started. And, you know, it's amazing how reparative the body is when you fast or when the body's inflammation is less. You know, the thing I would tell Susie is uh, being butter fast is, is, is I keep telling Jennifer, she's, it's like she read the biochemistry book without reading it. She, the beef and butter fast is a really great way to kind of tighten up the, the uh, chemistry set that we talk about in that book. Um, you know, how is your body's insulin? How much sugar is floating around your body? And using the beef and butter fast kind of puts you all the way to that carnivore level of a diet. Now that's very more advanced ketogenic diet, but it is the most uh, helpful um, uh, reset for your system. The thing that I tell patients when they get into a stall is check your numbers. You know, those are so important to just be able to look at your blood sugar, look at your blood ketones, uh, because everybody's chemistry set is a little different. And, you know, take for instance, that Jennifer now has kind of come through this really kind of hiccup of a time with uh, an infection and some antibiotics, but has kind of stepped through it with like a champ. And now, uh, you know, saying, well, what are my tools to understand how well am I going to stay on track? I mean, she does have the scale, which has helped her. You know, she has lost that uh, pound over the past week. But being able to track those numbers lets her see, you know, have those appropriate expectations. Your body was really going through a reset there. And um, whenever somebody's in a stall, I tell them, lay out the numbers. Let's see what they're doing. And we talk a lot about what this, the steps are that Jennifer's gone through, which is I need a zero calorie time for your liver to have a reset. 
and you do not get to move the time in the morning. Uh, one last question. Do you need to track every single thing you eat on keto is what Christina asks. Mm -mm. So that's not normal. Uh, our bodies, we were not meant as beings to track calories. You should have signals from your body that say, hey, I'm full. But that does mean that you're, you have to feed the body in a way that it can talk to you. And that's really where the ketogenic diet comes into play is that not only you can track it, you can measure it. And I love that as a scientist helping patients get healthier. I love that they can come in and track numbers. But what I find is, is so refreshing is you should not be counting calories from now till the time you die. I mean, counting carbs is something I think is a learning curve that happens at the beginning of a ketogenic diet. But as you kind of graduate to this comfortable level of I'm eating right for me because I feel full, I don't crave sugar, I'm not eating four to five times a day, and I'm, I'm at a weight that I like, or I'm losing weight that I wanted to. Uh, I am a big proponent that you should graduate away from me. You shouldn't need prescription medications. You shouldn't need to be counting things so obsessively that your whole life is around this food consumption. The signals that come into your body that are naturally there, when you feed them a high fat diet, those signals go from these broken little messages that are very tiny to peaks and valleys that are very clear signals to the patient that you are full, stop eating. And I think that's, that's a gift. Yeah. I think being able to identify that, um, when you switch over to the diet, it does happen. Like it's surprising when you eat really good food, especially something like beef and butter. I, I always say you can't overeat because that combination doesn't really let you. Right. You get it's, it. There's cholecystokinin. It is this hormone that says I am done. And like the, the thought of another bite is nauseating. Like, ugh. Yeah. And if, if you go to eat a carb, the, the carbs don't talk to cholecystokinin. So you're like, but I could eat these, these potato chips. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Yeah. We are trying to stick with this chemistry set that gives you satiety and fullness. And when you do that, they lose weight. Awesome. Well, this has been a wonderful talk. We've gotten through so many questions. Um, I thank you again for coming on and sharing your wisdom with everybody who's asking. Uh, do you have anything uh, to add before we close? I want to know when does the beef and butter fast start? Oh, you would ask me that. It starts uh, Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, it so it is this week. Wednesday. I wasn't sure if it was this week or next week. Okay. So, yeah. And uh, we've, we've linked it in the group. It, uh, we've linked um, it in the comments. There's a special group. It's only open until Tuesday evening and you have to get in before we close it because um, we don't leave it open for everybody and you have to participate. Well, you don't have to participate. You can watch it the first time, but we want you to be active. Mm, great. Okay. So I, I think I should do that too. Oh, good. That, oh, you, me, and John. John is like, when is it starting? I want it to start now. Everybody wants to do it because it, it is, it's super easy just to let people know you eat beef and butter for uh, four days and then you report your weight loss on the fifth day. Average weight loss is between four and five pounds statistically from everybody who reports their weight. Um, wow. It's super easy. You can prep ahead of time. There is a substitution list. You don't have to just eat beef and butter. Um, there's avocado, fish, there's all kinds of stuff, but it is really easy. And um, we have the whole plan for you and it's free. Why not join a challenge? Mm, yeah. All right. Great to start the new year. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.